it's a pleasure to be here and to see so many interested theoretical physicists uh, at this uh, MITP school on non-perturbative phenomena and early universe. So as already mentioned, I'm going to give uh, an introduction to lattice QCD. And although our final goal in these lectures is to understand how to use lattice discretization of quantum chromodynamics in order to learn about the low energy uh, phenomena and uh, to study the properties of quantum chromodynamics, um, I'm going to uh, spend almost uh, half of this uh, four lecture, uh, lectures that I'm going to give this week on studying a simpler theory, namely the uh, lattice discretization of uh, scalar field theory. And the reason for this is uh, threefold, so namely it's always easier to start from a simple and more familiar model. Then um, the second reason why we're going to do this is because um, the organizers asked me asked me to focus a little bit more in these lectures on the numerical aspects of QCD and its uh, and, and scalar discretization, of a discre discretized version of the scalar field theory allows us to already learn some advanced uh, lattice QCD uh, methods on an example of a simple theory. And finally, as some of you might be interested to simulate sim theories which are not only QCD-like um, on uh, by using numerical techniques, then learning to simulate several different versions of uh, so learning to simulate uh, that this discretized version of several different theories might be advantages for these applications as well. So. Um, how far we can do go in the simulations uh, of uh, in the understanding of QCD at uh, low energies uh, does not depend only on the theoretical advances in um, the discretization of, uh, uh, of, of, of gauge theories, but it also depends on um, how well we can perform uh, numerical simulations. And that's why the subtitle of these lectures will also be uh, theoretical at the same time. And we will try to give in parallel the algorithmic essentials of uh, lattice gauge theories. Uh, the plan of the lectures is as follows. So, as already mentioned, in lecture one, we will start with defining the scalar gauge theory on the lattice. In lecture two, we will immediately discuss uh, some of the basic simulation algorithms used in modern lattice QCD on this uh, simpler example of scalar field theory on the lattice. So lecture two will focus of on numerical simulations of scalar field theory on the lattice. Then lecture three, lecture three will finally uh, introduce this discret discretized version of uh, gauge and fermion fields on the lattice. So this would be the theoretical introduction into, into lattice QCD itself. We will call it gauge 
and fermion fields on the lattice. And finally, lecture four, we'll discuss some selected more advanced topics in lattice QCD, <coughs> again, mainly focusing on numerical simulations. If you want to contact me during or after these lectures, I will write down my email address here. So my name is Marina Kristic Marinkovic. I come from uh, Trinity College in Dublin. And you can contact me at the following email address mmarina at mats.tcd.ie Without further ado, let's start with the first out of these four topics, which would be here, which would be How do we define the scalar field theory on the lattice? Some literature that I find found very useful when preparing these lectures. So there is a vast literature on um, introduction to Lattice QCD available already. Several books are uh, on the market, including some recent ones that I'm going to mention uh, in uh, the course of these lectures, as well as some, some uh, old timers, which are nevertheless extremely useful for understanding this topic. So um, since we will start this retos uh, this lecture is with the motivation uh, to change from Minkowski to Euclidean space-time in order to study uh, gauge theories on the lattice. I would first recommend this uh, article on Scholarpedia by Jean Zinjustin. So the classical, uh, the classical. Um, literature uh, for understanding the uh, generating functional formalism, which is used in order to define a QCD partition function, or in this case, the partition function for scalar field theories, used to be the book of uh, Jean Justine, QFT, so quantum field theory and critical phenomena. But uh, uh, if you want to see the uh, shorter, and comprehensive um, introduction into the theory of generating functionals and uh, and uh, so we you can also look into this uh, scholarpedia article. from 2009. Then already becoming a classic, uh, an introductory book uh, to uh, quantum chromodynamics on the lattice by Christoph 
Gottschinger and Christian Lang. Quantum chromodynamics on the lattice and introductory presentation. By Springer Verlag, published in 2010. Then this first lecture in particular, as well, and the third one, where uh, gauge and fermion fields on the lattice will be um, introduced, follows the notation of Jan Smith's book. So this is one of the first books uh, on the introduction uh, to quantum field theories on the lattice. I will write a short version on this, of so introduction to quantum field theories on uh, lattice. Look in, look in, you can look for it by typing this uh, subtitle, uh, Robust Mate. And Finally, the structure of these lectures follows very clo closely the lectures given by uh, Luigi Del Debbio. So this particular lecture, lecture one, and uh, a more extensive write-up of the topics that are going to be discussed uh, in the lecture one can be found by looking up the notes of the BASTEP school in 2012, given by Luigi Del Debbio. All right. This would be some basic references for, uh, for the topics that we're going to discuss today. Uh, and before going any further, uh, can I please ask you to raise your hands if you have already had experience with uh, numerical simulations in Lattice QCD? All right. Uh, good. Some, let's see. 20%, I would say. And uh, have you had a chance to follow uh, any of the introductory courses for uh, lattice gauge theories independently of doing numerical simulations? OK, even fewer. All right, good. Then I hope um, this introductory presentation is going to be at the right level for all the newcomers to the field and still inspiring to the more experienced ones in the audience. Um, so let's start with the motivation. So you've probably heard already that uh, path integral formulation represents an elegant way to uh, quantize a field theory. And um, as we said, for a start, we are going to consider the scalar field theory on the lattice. And let's assume that the action uh, of the scalar field theory in arbitrary number of dimensions, so let's say in D dimensions, is given by some Minkowski expression uh, S of phi. Then 
we can write down the generating functional, and I will discuss in a bit more detail uh, why do we need to do that. So we can write the generative functional z of j, where j are some uh, so-called source fields, integral over d phi, and then in the exponential we would have i times this original uh, action of the scalar field theory in d dimensions plus uh, contribution to the action around the classical field configuration, which is expressed as the integral, so the d dimensional integral uh, of the product of the source, source field j of x times the original scalar field phi of x. So j of x represents source fields and this definition of uh, the generating functional set of j is the one which allows us to make the analog analogy between the field theory, so quantum field theory, in this case scalar field theory, and statistical mechanics, which we are going to uh, use vastly in these lectures, and uh, which is one of the basics of defining uh, quantum chromodynamics on the lattice. So, uh, so if you make the analogy with uh, with uh, statistical mechanics, then we can consider this set to be uh, par the partition function of the system. And we will discuss this analogy with statistical mechanics in a little bit more detail when we introduce the rotation from Minkowski space we have here into Euclidean space time later today. Um, for now, we are still in Minkowski space and um, we will define uh, the field correlators in Minkowski space known as Weitman functions. So this would be the so-called endpoint function or the vacuum exp expectation value of the product of n scalar fields, which we will denote as w as of of x1 to xn, and we said, so this is a vacuum expectation value of the field phi with the support in x1 times field phi support in x2, and so on, up to the field phi of xn. And then, Using this uh, generating functional on the left, we can write down the endpoint function. So it turns out that we can write down the endpoint function as uh, functional, so uh, the functional derivatives of this generating functional z of uh, yacht. So the endpoint function gives us a prefactor, so i minus i, sorry, minus i to the power of uh, n, and then we have n functional derivatives, so derivative with respect to source j1, derivative with respect to source j of x2, and so on. The derivative with respect to the source an of the original partition function of the system, which is defined by this generating functional z of j.
<coughs> so basically, starting from the field correlator uh, from this Whiteman function, so the endpoint function, uh, defined in such way, we can derive all physical quantities uh, by starting from these uh, field correlators. And then, so this is an overview of uh, the, our motivation for making this analogy between statistical mechanics and uh, and the quantum field theories. And uh, don't worry if you haven't seen any of this so far. So we're going to illustrate this relation between uh, Whiteman functions and uh, more familiar Hilbert space of physical s states. And the S matrix of the theory in the next section where we're going to introduce Kalen Lehman representation of a simple version of this one function, uh, so namely only for the two point functions. So there is this really handy uh, representation. which we are going to uh, derive by starting from some very well-known basic uh, uh, considerations that you've already met with in quantum mechanics. So already from the quantum mechanics, you know that uh, the physical states are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian operator. And uh, since the momentum operator and the, so let's denote the momentum operator as PK, so the Hamiltonian operator of the theory and the momentum uh, operator or the generator of spatial translations commute, mm -hmm. and then we know that uh, Hamiltonian and that the momentum operator can be diagonalized simultaneously. And, uh, or in other words, the eigenstates, uh, the physical eigenstates of the theory are at the same time eigenstates of the Hamiltonian and eigenstates of the momentum operator. So this means that if we label the eigenstates of the theory as with some index alpha and the corresponding momentum p. And then the eigenvalue corresponding to the momentum operator can be written as pk of the same eigenvector. Then, and, and at the same time, this set of physical states is the set of eigenvectors for the Hamiltonian operator. And we'll denote the eigenvalue in this case as E alpha of P. So E alpha is the energy, as you can see, of the states alpha p. Where alpha 
You should note here that alpha is um, labeling all the states in the theory, including also uh, multiparticle states. So E alpha of P is equal to the momentum squared plus M alpha squared where this m alpha is defined as the energy of the state in the center of mass frame. So I will just write down here as center of mass energy is denoted with m alpha. And So knowing the particle content of the theory, we will now in the next couple of steps derive the kellen lehmann representation for the two-point function, which can later be generalized into the formalism for endpoint functions, which we need in order to define uh, quantum field theory on the lattice. So for the states introduced over there on the right hand side, the uh, relativistic normalization condition can be written as following. So if we have a state alpha p, and alpha labeled with alpha prime and p prime <coughs> normalization would give us delta function times two times energy of the state two pi to the power of d minus one and the delta function for the momentum. And then, which in turn gives us the completeness relation. <coughs> Namely, one equals to the sum over all energy states, the integral over d minus 1 dimension, 2 pi d minus 1, 2 e alpha of p, and then subspace created by each of the uh, eigenvectors alpha p. So knowing these two facts, we can write down the two-point correlator. So the time-ordered two-point correlator for a scalar field phi of x and the scalar field at the point zero at the origin. So this by using Poincaré invariance, we can write down this first value of the field at phi of x as e to the i momentum operator times x, f of 0, so the translated field from phi of 0 to phi of x. And then we copy the field phi of x and 
So by inserting this complete completion relation, we can write this down as the sum over the states, all the states alpha. And now we have the integral over the d minus 1 dimension factor of 2 pi to the power of d minus 1. And I'm going to try to fit everything into one line here. So this equals the sum over sta all states p minus 1 p 2 pi to the minus to the power of uh, d minus 1 2 times the energy of the state alpha e to the minus i pi x and then f of zero between sandwich between the zero vector and the uh, alpha eigenvector squared. At the point in time where, so the time component of the momentum equals to the E alpha of And uh, this equals to the sum over the old states. Now we can write here a d-dimensional integral over the moment of p. So we have 2 pi to the power of d, e to the minus i pi x <coughs> the same expression so f of zero sandwich between the vacuum and the eigenstates <coughs> defined by the index alpha and momentum p squared divided by p squared minus m alpha squared plus i epsilon. So this state alpha of p can be obtained from, uh, from the state alpha at rest, so the state with momentum zero, by uh, using Lorentz transformation. So if we start from the state at rest, so we're going to try to express this uh, time ordered product two point correlator as a function of uh, the states at rest. And we'll do that by applying Lorentz boost to the state at rest. Which will give us state alpha at the momentum uh, P. Knowing this, we can rewrite this expression 
zero vector, five zero. The state uh, at momentum v as state at rest, boosted by uh, this Lorentz boost 5p, the field transforms under the Lorentz transformation in such a way that, as we know, the field is a uh, scalar, as the name of the theory says. So uh, we have a scalar field phi of 0, lambda p state alpha at rest. And this is equal, so since phi of 0 is a scalar, under Lorentz transformation, this is equal to just having phi of 0 here and the eigenvector of, of corresponding to the state alpha at rest. So if you go back to this um, time-ordered product, phi of x, phi of 0, We can write it down in the following way, and this represents the kellen lehmann uh, <coughs> representation of the two-point correlator. So integral over some mu squared from 0 to infinity, multiplying the so-called spectral density, which is a function of mu squared, times the free pro pro propagator for a particle of a mass mu squared, where these two expressions can be derived from our previous knowledge of the time-ordered uh, product of two scalar fields. So the free pop propagator for the particle of mass mu squared is given as the following. So i times the integral the d-dimensional integral over momenta divided by 2 pi, two pi to the dimension d, multiplying the <coughs> e to the minus i pi x, and then as you know, for the propagator for the particle of mass mu, we have pi squared minus mu squared in the denominator plus i epsilon. And the spectral density phi of mu squared, it is written such that each state, each state so each of these alpha, each of the states, uh, multiparticle states labeled by index alpha uh, contributes a delta function to the spectral density. So we have some factor set alpha, 2 pi, and then a delta function mu squared minus m alpha squared. So we have started from the standard expression for, expression for the 
two-point uh, correlator and derived this kellen lehmann representation, which expresses uh, the time-ordered endpoint function in a most general case, in this case two-point function, as the product of the spectral density and uh, free particle propagator for a particle of mass mu. So each single particle states contributing to this sum actually corresponds to the uh, single pole in the momentum space. And uh, as you will hear in some uh, more advanced uh, lectures on lattice gauge theories, this, uh, so each single particle state corresponds to a, to a very, very important exponential decay of the two particle functions, of the two point functions in Euclidean space time, which is very important for uh, some formal considerations in lattice gauge theories. So, So following the same reasoning, uh, we can also, so this was the two-point uh, correlator in, uh, in Minkowski space. And in a similar way, we can, by skipping some algebraic uh, complications, we can in an analog way, define the two-point correlator in Euclidean space-time. I will explain this x4 in a moment. So basically, the two-point correlator in Euclidean space-time that we are going to consider from now on um, assumes the red definition of the time coordinate. So what we use to call x0 in Minkowski space-time, as you know, which usually denotes the time coordinate. In this case, we are going to perform the so-called Wick rotation so we're going to rotate time coordinate in the complex plane such that uh, what used to be Minkowski x0 in Euclidean it becomes minus i times x0. And it's common to denote this time coordinate with an index d in a d-dimensional space, so in a four-dimensional space. So let me specify here that this would be the Euclidean space-time in 4D. Or if you wish, we can also write it down in arbitrary dimensions. So let's make it xd to remain for now in the data in a general expression, uh, to have a general expression for the d-dimensional scalar field theories. So following similar considerations as we had for the Minkowski two-point function, we would obtain that the Euclidean space-time uh, two-point correlator in d-dimension can also be written as a sum over all multiparticle states alpha. Uh, and then we will have d to the d minus 1 p divided by 2 pi to the power of d minus 1, 2 e alpha of p, e to the minus e alpha of p, x d 
in this case, e to the, so this would be the time component, e to the minus i phi x, the spatial component, and multiplying the same expression which we had here. So the sum of the contributions of all states at rest, since we've derived here that our the original expression here, which had eigenstates alpha, uh, eigenvector alpha at some arbitrary momentum p, can be, due to Lorentz invariance, written as just the sum of all over all multiparticle states at rest. We have squared here. So this concludes the discussion between the two-point correlator and the multiparticle spectrum of the theory. And uh, following the same line of arguments, one can derive the previously written expression for the relation between the n 4 correlator and uh, the spectrum of the theory. Um, so if you recall the first equation, now we will go back to the first equation which we've written for the generating functional set of J. I'm going to write it down here again. You have it in your in your notes already. So this first expression was the following. So, so we have written the generating functional S of phi plus integral over the d dimensions j source field times the scalar field x. And um, as you have seen, following this uh, line of considerations, we, we can actually also write this down easily in the Euclidean space-time. However, and we'll discuss the details of this a little bit later, however, there are two problems. So this tells us that we can immediately identify uh, the this generating functional as the partition, the statistical, in the partition function in uh, statistical physics. However, there are these two problems that arise when trying to use this generative functional approach uh, in order to define uh, the non perturbative approach to. Uh, quantum field theories. So the first problem is that this generating functional is usually defined in perturbation theory, actually, by expanding set of, Z, uh, uh, set of J um, in powers of the coupling constant. So it's well defined in perturbation theory, but the question arises what to do beyond if we want to go in the non perturbative region of QCD, for example, or any other theory that we try to discretize. And uh, the second question is a for a long time well-known fact, namely that this part integral has 
to define in such a way has uh, ultraviolet divergences. So it has to be regulated in some way and uh, afterwards renormalized. And uh, an approach which solves both of these problems at the same time is what we are going to discuss in the remaining of these lectures. So namely, if we formulate quantum field theory on the lattice, it at the same time solves both of these problems of generating functional approach. Namely, this allows us to define set of J, the partition function of the system beyond the perturbation theory. And as we will see at the same time, takes care of the unwanted ultraviolet divergences. So this solves, if you formulate the field theory on the lattice, this would solve uh, both problem one and problem two simultaneously. And now we will for the first time at these lectures and we'll do it over and over again by the end of this week. So we will draw the space-time lattice. We have to assume that these points are equally spaced, which the might not be on this drawing. So if we replace the continuum space-time with a discrete lattice, so the <laughs> then the previously mentioned two problems uh, from the generating functional approach get solved simultaneously. And we can, as we will see uh, in the moment, so the this path uh, integral in the original equation that we've written earlier today uh, turns into a multidimensional integral over the lattice field variables. So we will assume that we've replaced the continuum space-time with a discrete lattice where we will call the minimal distance between the two points on the lattice as A, the lattice spacing. And you will often, in the following considerations, especially in the numerical part of the lectures, alternate between writing down A or just considering that A is uh, equal to 1. But for the formal part, we'll still uh, keep the slightly spacing in all the expressions. And we will assume that the our dynamical variables in uh, lattice version of the scalar field theory will be placed in nodes of these lattices. So each of the so lattice sites highlighted here contains the dynamical variable 
5 of x defining this discrete space-time point. So x, spatial coordinate x, and time coordinate uh, t. So these will be the dynamical variables in our lattice scalar field theory. And then next thing we are going to do, as usual in quantum mechanics, so basically we are going to uh, promote these field variables x t into operators phi hat of x. So these are operators acting in Hilbert space of physical states similar to our uh, previous considerations in the beginning of this lecture. And then we will follow the following five steps in order to uh, formally define our scalar quantum field theory on the lattice. So the first step is the one which we've already indicated here. So we've promoted the dynamical field variables into operators. And so the first step would be to define the coordinate representation. So since naturally the discretization acts on the coordinate space, so we'll define We'll define the coordinate representation by introducing again the basis of state vectors denoted by uh, vector phi. And so these vector phi are the eigenstates of these operators uh, phi hat of x acting on in a Hilbert space of physical states phi and such that the eigenvalue is actually the field variable phi of So these eigenstates, when we've replaced the when we replaced the continuum space-time with discrete space-time, then these eigenstates are actually products over all. discrete spatial points, so x, spatial vectors x, and then summed over the eigenstates with the support at each, each spatial uh, vector, discrete vector x. And finally, the scalar product between the two vectors phi and phi prime is defined again as a product in this coordinate representation, the product over all spatial vectors x of the delta functions between the value of the field 
phi at x minus the value of the field phi prime at the same point x. So this defines, so these three equations here define the basis of eigenstates in the coordinate representation. And uh, so far, we haven't uh, discussed the time dependence of these uh, scalar fields, but we can recover this with uh, very little effort by instead of having this basis, basis of uh, eigenvectors to be time independent, so we can just reintroduce time dependence uh, if we in the final part, of so final step of this step one in defining the lattice version of the scalar gauge field theories would be to introduce, so to reintroduce basically the time dependence of the state vector phi. The next step in defining lattice scalar field theories would be something which we've already done in this illustration. Let's just write down that, so step two would be to introduce the lattice coordinates. Uh, So instead of continuum coordinate, which we had earlier, here we are going to have discrete coordinates, x mu, which would be equal to some integer number n mu times the lattice spacing A. So this n mu goes from 0 to n minus 1 if we are working in the finite lattice. So in principle, we can define the discretized theory under also on infinite space time, but for practical purposes, as for example, we would want to perform tomorrow or discuss tomorrow numerical simulations of such theories. And then in this case, we can place on a computer only a finite box, so finite amount of fields. So in this case, we're going to uh, focus on the considerations of gauge fear, gauge so on of uh, lattice scalar field theories in a finite box. So this sum goes up to some final uh, from 0 to n minus 1. And this then the finite box size is defined by the total di lattice dimension, which would be equal to n times a. Uh, index mu can, in principle, go from 1 to some arbitrary dimension d. But very soon, we are going to uh, limit ourselves to this d equal to 4. And tomorrow, in our uh, more practical part of the lectures, we will actually work even in one-dimensional scalar field theories. One can do some interesting uh, numerical exercises. So note again that in this case, since mu goes from 1 to d, as already mentioned earlier here, so xd is the Euclidean, so Euclidean time direction. While 
directions from 1 to d minus 1 are usually spatial coordinates. So we will also introduce for some further considerations the spatial. So the finite, so the box size in one dimension is uh, equals to L, so N, the number of lattice sites along one direction times the lattice spacing A. And then uh, since we are working in Euclidean space time, Usually, there is no difference between spatial and time coordinate anymore, which is very convenient, again, for representing these fields uh, on a computer. And um, so the, nevertheless, if we want to separate spatial and uh, time direction, we can define the spatial volume and write it denoted as Vs, as the box size L to the power of d minus 1. So this would be our spatial volume. And the total lattice volume, if we denote it with just V, as we said, since there is no difference between the Euclidean and time direction, we can, for simplicity, opt for the case for the symmetric lattice where time direction, the length of the time direction equals to the length of spatial directions. So then the total volume would be L to the power of D. And as we will see towards uh, the end of the Last lecture, one can in principle play between these differences. Uh, differences basically take different time and spatial extent, and this helps uh, in the practical considerations of lattice quantum chromodynamics. But in this case, so we will consider until we uh, note otherwise that the time direction and spatial direction are symmetric and then this would be total volume L to the power of D if we assume that uh, time direction has the same length as the spatial direction. And in the following considerations, we will also introduce uh, time extent t, but in physical units. So in this case, again, we assume that t equals to uh, L times A, okay, so in units of the lattice spacing A, or uh, which is usually given in Fermi's. Then the third step in this, uh, in defining this path integral that I'm going to delete again but it will reappear very soon. So the third step in defining lattice gauge theories is actually that the sum so instead of integrals in continuum space-time, we now work with sums over all lattice points. And then the sum over the total lattice volume now becomes a sum over these discrete points defined with the index, with this n-tuple index n. 
uh, with the power of the light, corresponding power of the lattice spacing ahead of the sum. So in d dimensions, we have lattice spacing to the power of d, and then these dimensionless sums. So if we imagine taking the limit of our some field valued fu functions with the support in x, in all lattice points x. And then if we imagine taking the limit that this lattice spacing A goes to 0, which we will later call the continuum limit, then we recover the original uh, integrals in the continuum space time f of x. So we basically, uh, when taking the continuum limit, we have to make sure that uh, we recover our original multi-dimensional integral in continuum space time. And we will discuss uh, in these lectures also what are some formal conditions in order to be able to claim that when taking the continuum limit from our discrete sums, we actually recover the original multidimensional integrals. Uh, the fourth step, so we have so far defined the coordinate representation, uh, specify what are our lattice coordinates, what's our spatial volume, total volume, and uh, that the relation between the multidimensional integrals originally and currently our sums, discrete sums on the lattice, which in the limit of lattice spacing going to zero, have to give back our initial multidimensional integrals. Yes? Your definition of temperature yeah. looks odd. I guess that should be n tau times a. You're right. So L. L divided by, uh, no. It's just the spatial n tau times a. Exactly, yes. So n tau times uh, a, Ex yes. Yeah. So um, you're right. So, the, so basically, it's the same as how we've defined, how we've defined uh, L uh, earlier. Yeah, so um, thank you for this. All right, uh, so the next step would be to, the next step would be to derive the derivatives on the lattice. And uh, so, so the, the derivatives uh, which are present in the original scalar uh, so the, in the continuum action of scalar field theories, in this case, will become finite differences. So the continuum scalar, so the derivative, the covariant derivative of the continuum scalar field will be discussed uh, in more detail later. But for now, it's just important to note that so the, just the forward derivative of the uh, scalar field at a point x is defined as the finite difference in this case, so in the simplest case, just between the nearest neighbors of the lattice. So uh, the forward derivative is the difference between the field and with the support in a point x plus a times the unit vector in, in an arbitrary direction, so mu direction in this case, minus f of x. So again, mu hat is the, considers, uh, it denotes the unit vector in mu direction. 
So this would be if this is our direction mu, chosen direction mu, this vector mu hat would be illustrated as following. So a unit vect vector of the length of the lattice spacing in some direction mu. And the we can also define the backward derivative, which would again be just the finite difference, but this time in the negative mu direction. So from phi of x, we would subtract the phi f, uh, the field phi in the point x minus a times uh, unit vector in uh, mu direction. So let me just correct myself. So uh, mu is a vector of length 1, and then a times mu hat would be what I've illustrated here. So this would be forward derivative, and the second formula would give us uh, backward derivative. So we can just call this fo step 4 uh, of the lattice discretization, uh, the fact that the derivatives become finite differences. These are the two simplest versions of uh, lattice derivatives, and we're going to discuss both from algorithmic point of view and from formal point of view some more advanced versions of lattice uh, and derivatives in due course. So, uh, so it turns out that uh, if we define uh, so if we follow these four steps, so already steps one to four in an um, unambiguous way define our previously discussed path integral, which used to be the integral over the field d phi, and then in this case, we had the exponential of the, in the exponential we used to have i times the Minkowski version of the uh, scalar field action. And if we define our theory by following <laughs> the steps 1 to 4, then we can write down the uh, new definition of the part integral, part integral using the Euclidean uh, version of the gauge of the scalar uh, field theory. I'm going to write down this action in more detail. Uh, note here that this integration over the field variables, since we are now working in discrete space time, actually the, uh, is equal to the product over all point points x of the integrals of the field variable in each uh, at each lattice point x. So instead of having the integral over uh, continuum spacetime, we now have the product over discrete set of points x of these uh, subintegrals and the Euclidean So these steps 1 to 4 also tell us that the, the original uh, Euclidean, uh, the, Euclid the original uh, uh, continuum action of the scalar field theory can now be written as sum over all lattice points x of 1 half d mu phi of x, d mu phi of x plus one half uh, 
m0 squared, so phi squared term of the scalar field action, and then plus phi to the 4 term, so 1 over 4 factorial g0 times phi of x to the power of 4. So instead of the original integral over d4x, 1 has the sum over the old lattice coordinates x. Then uh, we've defined a prescription how to change from continuum derivatives into uh, discrete uh, lattice derivatives. And then this fields 5 of x, so 5 of x squared and 5, 5 of x to the power of 4 is just the field variables defined at each lattice point x, and then squared and uh, fourth power of these fields. Uh, let's note that before concluding this first part, of the lectures, let's just note that m m zero squared in the so m zero squared and g zero in the Euclidean version of the discretized Euclidean scalar field action. So in this case, m0 squared and g0 are bare couplings. And those couplings define the scalar theory, uh, so th the scalar field theory at the scale of the ultraviolet cutoff imposed by this uh, lattice spacing so the minimal distance between the two uh, between the two points in the spatial direction, which as we, will, as we will discuss in more detail further, translates into the uh, cutoff of the uh, ultraviolet cutoff of the momenta. Um, and in this equation here, they're still, uh, so they're supposed to be bare couplings, but they're still uh, dimensionful quantities. So in order to discuss uh, renormalization group flow, we will have to rescale <coughs> So let's write down again the equation which we have on the right hand side in case you can't see it. So it's sum over x one half d mu phi of x d mu phi of x to the power of 4. So in this equation here, m0 squared and g0 are still dimensionful quantities. So we'll have to rescale them so to, to, risk, to rescale the dimension full into dimension less quantities <coughs> 
so the dimension of the dimensional so the reason why this function this uh, in this definition here m0 squared and g0 are dimensionful quantities is as you know from dimensional analysis that in order for Euclidean, so the total action to be dimension less, uh, the dimension of the scalar field would be equal to d minus 2 divided by 2. So in case of four dimensional space time, would just be equal to 1. And uh, this choice of Euclidean action is such is such that uh, in the limit, again, so similarly as in this general assumption that we made here in the step three, that in the limit of lattice spacing going to zero, we obtain discretized, uh, we obtain the original uh, uh, multidimensional integral. So the choice of the Euclidean action made here has to be such that this SE, if we take the limit of lattice spacing going to zero, so if we take the continuum limit, it has to give us the original continuum action of the scalar field theory. So optional, so I will conclude with this, but before doing that, let me just give you optional homework question that we may discuss on Wednesday's discussion. So this will be possible topic for Wednesday's discussion, discussions. So I want you to think about uh, what do we know about the symmetries of the newly derived Euclidean action. S E of F. So let me give you a little hint. So the first point would be that, so as in the continuum, uh, the S E has to be, has to preserve uh, the reflection symmetry. So basically it has to be symmetric under transformation of phi into minus phi. And you can play with these definitions of lattice derivatives in order to demonstrate that this is indeed the case. And uh, the second thing that you may uh, want to think about, and we can discuss this later, is uh, if we start from continuum Lorentz symmetry, which is obviously the symmetry of the scalar field action in the continuum, uh, what does this <coughs> symmetry group turns into once we've discretized the, uh, the space time and once we, are re we have replaced the continuum space time with the uh, finite lattice. All right, I'll end the first lecture here and we'll continue tomorrow with some more practical implementations of the simulations of the theory which we've discussed today. Thank you. Yes, please.
discuss this. All right, so we should discuss this a little bit uh, in the beginning of the of the lectures tomorrow. But that's a very good question. So, um, uh, so it uh, so it turns out that uh, one in order to make this relation between the uh, quantum field theory and statistical mechanics and uh, to take the advantages of what we know from statistical mechanics one has to be very close to the so-called um, critical line or in, in the space of one parameter to the critical point and we will discuss tomorrow in a little bit more detail uh, uh, why is this the case. So, so uh, in order to be able to make this uh, continuum limit so uh, to have a well-defined continuum limit, one indeed has to be in the choice of, in the right choice of, or in the vicinity at least of the right choice of the, uh, of the in the parameter space. And we'll discuss tomorrow in more detail how one does that. But that's a that's a really good point. There was another question. Yes, please. Because when we take the continuum limit, it's only the UV cutoff that we take. Because it's only the lattice spacing that we take to zero, we do have computational limitations on the size of the lattice. So, because because I see two problems there. Even if we do in that L equals n a, if, even if we do take a going to zero and n take n going to infinity, we we are still living in a finite size box. So precisely, but one can in principle define. Uh, uh, the discretized theory on an on an uh, infinite space time, but yeah. So and then one one can take the two limits, uh, or you can work in a finite box size and then take the two limits independently, as you've as you've just mentioned. So it's also very important in which order one takes these two limits in order to keep the theory well defined. Uh, in this case, but yeah. So uh, so for. Uh, for our, all our purposes here, we will be in the uh, in the uh, finite uh, space time. Also, at this stage, it doesn't matter if we take the symmetric difference formula because it's a scalar field, and we are talking about the square of the d mu phi. Precisely. Yes. So, uh, um, so I will discuss this a little bit again tomorrow. So, uh, like I'm just asking, I could also have used the symmetric difference formula here. You could use, well, th it does, uh, so instead of your error, so, so you're basically, you are interested in the, your error, so that how far along are you from the, uh, so the error that you're making uh, is defined by how far you're along from the continuum uh, action. So this basically, so how fa how fast are you approaching to the uh, to the continuum limit of your theory? And then if you take the symmet the forward or backward derivative, the simplest version that we've defined here, then your rate of approach to the continuum limit is proportional to a. And if you take the symmetric, so uh, what's your name? Sorry, Simran. 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 What Simran is talking about is uh, so for those of you who haven't met yet with the uh, symmetric derivatives. So what one can do instead of taking this forward or backward derivative, one can just take the uh, sum of the forward and backward derivative, where. Uh, these two terms would obviously uh, cancel, and then one would get the uh, the so-called symmetric derivative, and then um, the approach of the observables defined with this uh, uh, with the standard, so the naive the, the standard derivatives would be with approach to the continuum. Uh, derivative with the rate of order a and then the symmetric derivative would approach to the continuum with the order of uh, a squared and then 
it just gives us, allows us to approach the continuum results uh, at a higher rate if we take more symmetric versions. These are really good points. Thank you.